Hello? <laughs> Well, I was asked to uh, welcome everyone tonight and, and lead us off with a prayer. I don't want to be the guy that it gets blamed on for starting late. I know that that gets pushed down the line and, and, it, and then it gets pushed back uphill. So uh, we want to get started tonight. We want to uh, welcome everyone. So happy to see everyone that made it out tonight and, and, um, and really looking forward to... Uh, these three men tonight and, and their topics and, and their lessons and so thankful they're here. We're thankful that uh, each one of you are here. Uh, I know I'm thankful to be here tonight and, uh, and so happy to see everyone. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you so much. We thank you for the church. We thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of the church. And Father, we, we pray that uh, as we hear these lessons tonight from Dan Owen, from Eric Owens, and from Hiram Kemp, Lord, that we'll open our hearts and minds and just, just listen and take it in. Father, I pray that uh, each one of us would be able to uh, put aside the things of, of the world, the things that are on our minds right now, and that we would just be present. Father, help us to be present in these lessons and uh, to be engaged at this time. And, and Father, just help us to focus our hearts and minds on your word. Lord, we're so thankful uh, for these men, their families, uh, their commitment to you. Um, the work that they do in their home congregations, and Father, the work that they're doing and helping us do here at West Hill. Father, we pray that you would bless each one of these lessons tonight uh, and just be with us. Father, we're, we're mindful of those among us that are suffering, and we pray that you would be with them. Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's suffering spiritually, we just pray that you would be with them and, and that they would be blessed tonight by the hearing of your word. Father, we're so thankful tonight to be called your children. And uh, Lord, we're most thankful that your son brought us that opportunity. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good evening, church. If you would, would you be standing as we prepare our hearts to receive the word of God? We're going to sing our God. He is alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God so strongly beside. The
echo what's already been said and thank you and welcome you to be here tonight at the West Hill Lectures. I have the honor and the privilege to introduce our first speaker this evening, Brother Dan Owens, who comes to us from Paducah, Kentucky. He has been the preaching minister there for 32 years and he has been the teaching minister for the last few years there. And I believe the teaching minister fits him well because Dan, I believe, is a teacher at heart. Uh, Whitney and I both got to go to Bear Valley Bible Institute, and in 2007, Dan started teaching um, uh, through Polycom system remotely to the classes, and we were his guinea pigs. And so uh, we have some good memories and better memories. <laughs> And so I, I really appreciate Dan. I don't know how much you know, how much you have impacted my life and my study habits, but he gets into the depth of the word and he makes sure that you're being truthful with the word. He also has been teaching and records uh, on an online program called Global Preacher Training. He teaches in English and is fluent in Spanish. He also has a weekly podcast entitled Conversations with Dan. You ought to go check it out if you get a chance. He is an author. He has some books back there on the back table if you are interested in those. He does a great job of breaking things down, making them palatable for us to digest and to understand the truth of God's Word. So, I don't want to take any more time away from him. I pray that you will give your utmost attention to what he has to say tonight as he speaks to us on what we are walking into dealing with Athens coming from the book of Acts. Thank you, buddy. Am I on? On? Not on. Let me see it. Am I on? Okay, I am. Good deal. Okie dokie. PowerPoint's good. There, now let's back him up. Oh, let's back him right to there. All right. You guys have been a great congregation. You're one of those congregations that has a wonderful mix of people. You love the Lord. You love his word. You love each other. It's been a privilege to be here with you this week and to associate with these men. These are excellent preachers that you have invited in here. I respect every one of them as a student and teacher of the Word, and I know that they have been a blessing to you as they have been to me. I appreciate being fed by them uh, this week. Tonight we're going to be talking about walking into Athens, and I think our church family at different places really needs map lessons because most people today that read the Bible don't have a clue where they're talking about, when they're talking about. But uh, the northern Greece up here, Macedonia, this is the churches where we have Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. Philippi in Acts 16, Thessalonica in uh, Berea in Acts 17, in Acts 18 down in Achaia, Corinth is established, you see. Sincrea is where Phoebe was from, it's a little port city of Corinth. Then, of course, we have Athens, where we're talking about tonight, and Delphi. Athens, Delphi, Corinth, and Sincrea were the churches of Achaia, and maybe there was a church in Sparta. We do not know. So, walking into Athens. Now, my problem tonight in trying to teach you this lesson is I'm afraid you don't believe a lot of the stuff I'm going to say. Okay? That's okay. We're going to say it anyway. But um, I just want you to get ready to open up your mind. You know, free your mind, and the rest will follow. That's what we're trying to get you to do, see, when, when we're starting to preach here. So walking into Athens is going to be a challenge for the people in this room because we live in a secularized society. We don't believe in the spirit world. We don't believe in the gods. We don't believe in angels and demons. Now, we say we do, but we really don't very much. We're the heirs of the philosophy of John Locke and they're very scientific and everything, and the scientific method is only going to lead you one place, and that's to materialism. It's going to lead you to matter. In fact, the scientific method looked at by itself will only lead you to matter. It will never lead you to the spirit world. The deck is stacked. It's not going to tell you about God. <clears throat> it's not going to tell you about the Spirit. But when you walk into Athens, if you're going to relate to the people in Athens, you've got to believe in the world above us. You've got to believe in the heavenly realm. You've got to believe in the spirits. You've got to believe in the gods. And we're going to talk some more about that. See, I see some of y'all are nervous. That's good, because I mean you're listening. Okay. In Colossians 2, verse 8, it, it talks about philosophies of men in the, the city of Athens 
They believed in a multiplicity of gods. They believed in spiritual beings. And they believed in capricious spiritual beings that were a lot like men and women that got angry, that were in bad moods, that liked some people and hated other people. They had affairs with each other. They had wars with each other. They got out of sorts. They were like people, see? But they believed that they were up in the spiritual realm and involved in the lives of people uh, down on earth. Now, see, the trouble that we have today walking into Athens is we don't really relate to that worldview in very much of a way, though we should. A biblical worldview is not a secularized worldview. A biblical worldview believes wholeheartedly in the spiritual realm and in the envelopment of that spiritual realm in the affairs of men. That is a biblical worldview. But we are heirs of another view that says that was then, but this is now. That was then, but this is now. God and the spiritual realm was involved with us back then, but no more. See, God went on a long vacation after the first century, and he left us all on our own. See, that's what we believe, even though we don't state that sometimes. Unfortunately, that's not a biblical view. Okay, so what about the spiritual world? Let's talk about it a little bit. It's divided into two parts, creator and created. In the spiritual world, I'm talking about, okay? Ephesians 1, starting in verse 19, Paul wants us to know what is the greatness of God's power toward us who believe, according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Now listen, far above all rule and authority and power and lordship and above every name that is named. Now, let's rewind that. Those words right there, rule, authority, dominion, and power, those words in Paul, if you, if you watch those words throughout Paul, those are talking about demonic powers. Those are talking about spirit beings, fallen angels, evil spirits. That's what they're talking about, see? And Christ was exalted, it says, far above all those things. And listen to that last part. And every name that is named. In Athens, those names were being named. In Athens, other names were being named. Other, other gods, other beings were being called upon. And you say, yeah, but that's the gods and the gods don't exist. Oh, that's another non-biblical view. That is a non-biblical view. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. All right? Now, stay with me. I know you're hurting right now. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Satan is called the prince of of the powers of the air. What does that mean, the powers of the air? Well, that's those rulers and authorities and dominions and lordships over which Christ has been exalted. Do you think Ephesians 1, and 23 says Christ is the head of the church? No, it doesn't. What it says, if you read the context, is that Christ has been exalted over all those spirit beings and he is the head of all things. That means all those spirit beings in the interests of the church. Go back to 1 verse 19. He uses his power against those things in the interests of the church. Colossians 1.18 says he's the head of the church, but not that passage. So we can't read it because we don't believe it. See? And we just read over it and we don't stop and think about what we're doing when we're walking into Athens. In Ephesians 6.12... This brother back here has already reminded of us our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What did you say? Not against flesh and blood. But what is it against? It's against the principalities and powers, the rulers and authorities, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. That's what Christ has been exalted over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. That's what he uses his power over for the interests of the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. In Ephesians 3, 9, it says the great purpose, the eternal purpose of God was even made known to the principalities and powers when it was revealed to the apostles. See, Paul believed in the spirit world. And I'll guarantee you in Athens, the people believed in the spirit world, whether you and I do or not, they did, and Paul did, and the whole Bible does. So I think it's time we check ourselves and see if we really have a biblical world view. Now those Greeks in Athens worshipped gods like these. You've got Dionysius up there and Mars up there. I didn't want to show you the rest of Mars because it was kind of ugly, you know. 
But uh, you've got Dionysius and Mars, and there's some other female goddesses up there. And these were like people, see, in their minds. They had a misconception of God. They fought wars with each other. They had competition. They were rivals of each other. They had affairs with each other, you know. And the gods mess up people's lives or bless people's lives. And, and the pagan in Athens would be running from temple to temple to temple, trying to cover all the spiritual bases and keep all the gods happy so that he could live his life and not get sick and his kids would find a husband or wife, et cetera, et cetera. But see, the problem with these people's concept was it didn't come from God. God is not a man, Numbers 23, 19. See, he's not a man. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher. So if you make him into a man, you've demoted God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Oh, but Moses, pardon me, the gods don't exist. Wait a minute now. If the gods don't exist, why did he say you shall have no other gods before me? We're going to come back to that. I know you all still don't like it. In Romans chapter 1, the invisible things of God are clearly seen being perceived through the things that are made even his everlasting power and divinity that they, the pagan world, like Athens, might be without excuse, okay? <clears throat> Verse 23, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of the image of corruptible man and beasts, or birds and four-footed beasts and reptiles. If you make an image of a man or a beast and say that's God, you lower the whole concept of God. Romans 1, 28, seeing as these pagans refuse to have the true God in their knowledge, in their consciousness, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you think anybody today needs to get reacquainted with God and who the God of the Bible really is? There are a lot of people, church, listen to me, that do not have our worldview at all. And they're living in Dallas and they're living in this town and they're coming up from Central and South America, and they're coming from the Asian, uh, Asian countries, and they're coming from India and other places, and they do not share our worldview. They believe wholeheartedly in the spirit world, in the spiritual world. We're walking into Athens. I wonder if we in Churches of Christ really have anything to say to that group, group of people. This is a portrayal of some of the pantheon of the Greek gods that they worshipped in the city of Athens. Let's talk about the word God for a minute. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim, God. It's talking about Yahweh, the creator there. In the beginning, God. But if you go over to Psalm chapter 8, Psalm 8, and you say, you know, if I consider... Uh, the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars that thou art, or, or, has ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? You made him a little lower than the angels. Hebrew, Elohim. Same exact word as in Genesis 1-1, Elohim. Angels. The word Elohim means great, mighty. And the greatest and mightiest created the world. That's Yahweh. See? But the angels are also called Elohim. You know what that translates to in many passages in the Old Testament? Well, I just quoted you on Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other Elohim before me. Gods. So do we believe in Elohim? We better. I can, quote you, I can show you all the way through the Old Testament. It is not that the Old Testament taught that there are no gods. Little G-O-D-S. The Old Testament and the New Testament teaches that there are other gods, great and mighty beings in the spiritual realm, but they are created beings. They are not the creator, and we must not worship them. But are they powerful? You better believe they are. They're very powerful. And that's where we mess up, because we just thumb our nose and don't even act like they exist, and Satan's got us right exactly where he wants us when we believe that sort of thing. You know, the church today is sort of like uh, the people. Paul walks into Athens, and they've got all their gods, and he sees all this paganism, and Paul is a Jew, and he's a Pharisee, and this is totally 
you know, foreign territory, this paganism, and he sees all their idols and everything, and, and it says this, uh, this Epicurean and Stoic person comes up to him, and he's been preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and they say, man, we've got to hear about this other thing. It's a new thing. See, to them, this was a new God. This was another base that they needed to cover. This was something that they could talk about among the philosophers who thought that the gods had about as many philosophies about how we ought to live as men do. See? Take heed that no one makes spoil of you through philosophies, through the traditions of men, according to the elementary worldly principles like the pagans, but not according to Christ. See, they could talk all day about how different gods and different philosophers thought they ought to live, but it wasn't coming from God. Now, some people think that the pagans, the, the gods, the demons, the spirits that they worship, don't have any power. Well, just, just hold your tater just a minute. Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet arises among you, or a dreamer of dreams... And he shows a sign, and even if that sign comes to pass, and he tells you to follow after other gods, you stone him to death. Now, could the, could the guy actually do the sign or make the thing? Yes. But he told you to follow after other gods. You know, we read Matthew 24, 24. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, if possible, to deceive the elect. Well, we just say that those really weren't signs and wonders, because that's impossible. Those, they were, those were just tricks like a magician, but that's not what the Bible teaches. In, in Exodus, when Moses, you know, went before the Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And he threw down his rod and it became a snake. And those other pagan priests threw down their rods and they became a snake. Oh, but it was just a trick. It wasn't real. You see, what we're doing is we're reading our secularism our, we don't believe in the spiritual, our scientific method world, we're reading that back into the pages of the Bible, but that is not the biblical worldview. Do you notice in Exodus that those guys were able to imitate the plagues that God sent for the first few, but then their power ran out and God's power were graded because the demons that they worship were created beings and God is the creator, omnipotent, omnipresent. He is Yahweh, see? This is a biblical view. I'm saying if you, don't, if you want to walk into Athens, you need to wade into this pond that we're in right here. And there are more and more people around us in, in this country today that we're going to have to wade into this pond. And the message that they need to hear, the message of Christ that they need to hear about Christ and the powers is that Christ has been exalted above all the powers and He has far greater power than any of the powers. And if you have Christ... Well, that's all you need. You know, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.19 talks about the man of lawlessness and how he'll perform miracles and signs and lying wonders. Well, they, they center on the word lying wonders as if it, they're just tricks or not really. No, you look at the words there. They're the same words as in Joel 2. It's not that he doesn't do the wonders. It's that when he does them, he's trying to do like the prophet of Deuteronomy 13 and tell you to follow another god. Don't read back modern secularism into the pages of Scripture. The pagans in the time of Paul in Athens, they liked the spectacular. They liked the miraculous. They liked the, the wow, you know. In Delphi, there was the famous uh, uh, oracle of Delphi, you know, the steam rising out of the ground in that temple and the oracle, the prophet, who would, uh, the steam would come up and they would start speaking in tongues. Did you know the pagans spoke in tongues all the time? The jibber jabber, like the Pentecostals do today? The pagans did that. People all over the world have done that. They didn't do what the apostles did on Pentecost and speak languages that they've never learned, but they did the jibber jabber kind of ecstatic utterances and they would tell people, This is what the God so and so tells you when they spoke in those tongues. Did you know in Colossians 2, verse 18, that Garrett was preaching about this morning, let no man rule against you through these different things, and he mentions dwelling in things that he has seen. They're talking there about the custom of incubation, where a person would go into the temple of Serapis or the temple of Dionysius and spend the night in that temple, and they would chew the right kind of mushroom or smoke the right kind of weed or do whatever, and they would sleep, and they would have a vision. 
And it would be a very powerful, strong vision. And they would say that God spoke to me like this. And they'd say, have you had any experience like that? And the Christian would say, well, no. And they'll say, well, you must be lacking something. They trusted in their experience. I've seen this. I have felt this. You've known people from Pentecostalism that have said, I've seen this. I have felt this. We have a student that we used to have. He's still in our graduate program, I think, that he's from the Cayman Islands, and his sister is a voodoo priestess. And if you want to sit down and talk to him about what can happen in the pagan world, he'll curl your hair telling you stories. Don't tell him that the spirits don't exist. They exist, but our God is Yahweh. Our God is the creator, not the created being. So, Satan guides us to these feelings and these experiences so that we'll make those things our authority. That's what he does with pagans instead of making God's word our authority. In the Bible, people that could do miracles were sometimes false prophets and priests of pagan religions. But that doesn't mean we should follow them if they contradict the word of God. They also believed in Athens and other places like this, in Hades, the lord of the underworld. This was a god, Hades, that they worshipped. And the term Hades came to refer to where all the dead people are. It had good dead people and bad dead people in it, but the realm of the dead, Hades. You know, Jesus said, that I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He means that those mythological gates, that when you die, you go through those gates and they close, you never come back out. Jesus was going to come back out. And the gates of Hades did not prevent him from building his church. You will not leave my soul in Hades, Psalm 16, Acts 2, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In Hades, in the realm of the dead, in the grave where the worms crawl in and the worms crawl out. See, Hades. So they believed in this, but pagans take it a step further. Now let me tell you, so do a lot of people around us. There are people that come up from South America, Central America, uh, in Brazil, the spiritists. uh, They come from Africa, they're animists. They are Native American uh, brothers and sisters who believe in animism and the spirits of the animals and all these things. And there are people from the the Celtic culture that have these same things and the Germanic cultures and many others, see? And they they believe in these spirits and they also, I went too fast for that one, they also believe in contacting the dead. Part of their religion is contacting the dead. They believe that we should consult the dead because the dead can affect the living. And so they pray to the dead. Do do you all have the Dia de los Muertos around here? Where they, you don't know what the Dia de los Muertos are? And you all are living in Corsicana. What? Texas? What world are you living in? The people that come up from Central and South America, they go out on Dia de los Muertos or All Saints Day and they put food and whiskey and flowers and all kinds of stuff on the tomb of their granddaddy or their grandmother or their dad or their mother and they commune with the spirits of the dead. And the Celtic people did this in their paganism, and they build the fires of Samhain at at All All Hallows Eve, you know, and and they believe the spirits of the dead are running around. Now, when the Christian, so-called Christian missionaries came into some of these countries, like the Celtic countries, what the Christian missionaries did was they said, look, guys, These guys are going to pray to the dead. We can't do anything to keep them from it. So if they're going to pray to the dead, let's help them pray to some Christian dead. And so they they got the names of some really nice Christian people, and they called them saints, and they said, you can pray to Christian dead people, but not pagan dead people. But you know what? The Bible condemns that. In Deuteronomy 18, it talks about mediums and spiritists and necromancers, and it says those things are an abomination to the Lord. Why didn't God want those people reaching out to the dead and communing with the dead? Saul did this when he was out of favor with God. He didn't know wherever to turn. And he went in 1 Samuel 28 to the medium of Endor. 1 Samuel 28, verse 11, I think somewhere following that, he says, you know, what do you want me to do? This lady says, and he says, bring up Samuel. And the lady does. And we say, no, that's not real. She didn't really do that. And Samuel gives him a message just like the living Samuel gave, told him the truth and told him to straighten up just like he did when he was living, see? She didn't really do that. Yes, she did. But it was an abomination to the Lord. It's evil. It's paganism, see? 
So we've got to realize, see, we can't help these people. All of these people around us who have these worldviews, the Hindus, they come. There's many, many Hindus uh, in the United States from India and, and other places. They believe in thousands and thousands of deities. They worship Ganesh and Shiva and all these others, you know, Krishna and all these others. They're, they're demonic powers that they're worshiping. But if we don't even believe in the existence of those things, we don't have much of a message for them when it comes to the power and lordship of Jesus Christ. So Paul is walking through Athens, and he sees this statue, and it says, to an unknown God. And he says to these people, I perceive that you're very religious people. And as I passed along and saw all the object of your worship, see, he wasn't disrespecting those people. He was trying to meet them where they were. He said, I saw an altar to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, that's what I proclaim to you. That's our message for Athens. What therefore you worship in ignorance. That's the God that I proclaim to you. Um, people hate this next verse I'm going to show them. I don't know why. Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper and eating meat sacrificed to idols. By the way, when studying for the, the book on Corinthians... I did some research in the Oxyrhynchus papyri. And in the Oxyrhynchus papyri, there are numerous papyri that are actual invitations from people to other people to come to idolatrous meals in an idol's temple with them. And sometimes even in their own home, they had idolatrous meals in honor of the god Serapis or Dionysius or whatever other god or goddess that they have, just like we read about in the book of Corinthians. And so Paul says... The sacrifices which the Gentiles sacrifice, you're talking about pagans. Just like we have all over the world today in other cultures. They sacrifice to demons. What are demons called in the Old Testament? Elohim. Elohim. Mighty ones. They're greater and mightier, mightier than men, but they are created beings who fell from heaven, who follow the archangel Satan, and they're trying to destroy us, and we denigrate and thumb our nose and act like they don't exist, and they have victory over us because we don't take them seriously sometimes, okay? He goes on to say, can you drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons? Can you eat at the table of the Lord and the table of demons? Will you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are you stronger than he? Do you think the Lord is jealous over something that doesn't exist? Would you be jealous of your husband or wife over a person that didn't exist? That's dumb. They do exist. See? And this is the nature of paganism. Now walking into Dallas today. Where's your Uber driver from? I'm just asking, you know. Where, where are half the people you meet at the airport from? You know. Where are the people that work in the outlying portions of this town? Where are they from? What do they see? How do they see the world? I'll guarantee you, they see it a whole lot more like the people in Athens saw it than the way we secularized, atheistic-influenced people think in the United States. Oh, but you say, no, we're not. We're religious people. Well, you need to get a biblical worldview if you truly are a religious people. You know, why don't we believe in the strengthening of the power with the Spirit in the inward man like Paul prayed for? Because we don't believe in the spiritual world. How are we going to believe in the power of God that, that Hiram was talking about if we don't believe in the power of the devil? We don't even believe there's something to be powerful against, see? We believe all that quit many years ago. And we could talk about this much more, but not so according to what I think. God delivered us out of the power of darkness, Colossians 1.13. Does that mean anything? And he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. When we were baptized and we had faith in the working of God, one of the things God was doing when we were baptized, having despoiled the principalities and powers, Colossians 2.15. What does that mean? It means when you were baptized, God reached down and he grabbed a hold of you and took you out of the grasp of the demons and brought you under the benevolent rule of Jesus Christ, Lord of all things. See? That's what he's talking about right there. But if we don't even believe in him, we don't get the power of what's done there when we trust in the working of God. So walking into Dallas or walking into Denver or walking into Corsicana or walking into um, Paducah, it's not so different. 
we're going to encounter atheists, Central American spiritists, people that practice centuria, voodoo. We're going to uh, encounter Africans that are animists. We're going to uh, uh, encounter South and Central American uh, Hispanics who are a mixture of Catholicism and paganism, and it really is that. Uh, we're going to encounter Hindus. We're going to encounter all these people. What do we have to say to those people? Well, here's what Paul said, starting in Acts 17, verse 24. The God that made the world and all things therein. There is creator and created. Yahweh alone is creator. Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive the glory and the honor and power. Why? Because thou created all things, and by thy will they existed and were created. That's why we worship God, is he is the creator. These other powers are created. Yes, they're more powerful than men, but they are created. Thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They, the heavens and the earth, shall perish, but thou continuest. They shall grow old as doth a garment, as a mantle thou shalt roll them up, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12. So, he says, The God that made the world and all things that are therein, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything. All those Athenians, they ran to those temples to meet with whatever god or whatever demonic power they were worshiping, but you cannot put our god in a box. You cannot put him in a building. Heaven is my throne. Earth is the footstool of my feet. What manner of house will thou build unto me, and what shall be the place of my rest? Isaiah 66, verse 1. You can't put God in this building and come visit him here and leave him there. He is with us and enveloped with us and walking with us everywhere we go and sees everything we do. When I ascend into the heaven, thou art there. When I descend into Sheol, thou art there. When I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy right hand shall lead me and thy hand shall guide me. Psalm 139. God is everywhere and so are the angels everywhere and so are the demons everywhere. There's spiritual warfare going on, see? You can't put God in a temple. He is omnipresent. Neither is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything. There's nothing you have that God needs. He owns everything already, see? All right. People need to know that all people are the same in the one loving creator's eyes. He made of one every nation of men to dwell upon the face of the earth, having determined their appointed seasons and the boundaries of their habitations. When I clasp hands with that Hindu man whose world is so different than mine, he and I come from the same place. We are of one. He, he is my brother human being. God loves him like he loves me. See? We should not look at him the way uh, human beings do after the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, but we should look at him in a different way. So he made all people the same in his eyes, okay? So he made of one every nation to dwell upon the uh, face of the earth, having determined their appointed seasons, the seasons of the nations, and the boundaries of their habitations. God controls all that. That's who we're telling people about, is the God who made the world, the God who is everywhere, the God who in, uh, controls the governments of the world. They need to know that they were made to seek God. See, when you start, he made of one from every, every nation of men, and you go down through that, it says that they should seek God, if happily they might feel after him and find him. How, why were we made by Yahweh on this earth? To seek God. That is our one sole purpose in the world, to seek God if happily we might feel after him and find him, see? Our life should be about seeking God. Are you seeking God tonight, see? If you're not, you should be. We should be seeking God so that we might feel after him and find him for he's not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our very being as one of your own poets said, we are his offspring. And if we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone crafted by artifice and craft of men. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked. But now he calls all people everywhere to repent. Now, how are we going to call all people everywhere whose worldview is so different than ours to repent if we don't even understand the biblical worldview 
And we can't even present against the backdrop of their worldview the true one God and his position in the universe that Paul told those people about in the city of Athens. And he says, God calls all men everywhere to repent inasmuch as he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. We call them to repent in view of judgment. And he has given us assurance of that, he says, in that he has raised him from the dead. We tell him about the death and resurrection of Christ, and we call them to the one true God who has power over all those demons they've been worshiping all this time and can be the only thing they need in their life. So we need to walk into Dallas or Corsicana the same way we walk into Athens. Ah, I'm done, I think. Put a fork in me, I'm done. Love you, appreciate you. Thank you for being here, respect all of you. Hope to see you again soon. Church, did you know what you was walking into tonight? Dan, thank you for that challenge. Thank you for the in-depth and the insight. And what we are trying to do in ushering us into Athens, but not just Athens, ushering us into the world that we live in and how we approach and address that. We're going to take a short break. If you need to use the restroom and you are a visitor or use a water fountain, there are some to the doors this direction and back, some over here right behind this hallway. We're going to take a few minute break and you are dismissed for now and we'll reconvene in just a moment.